And and maybe it also relates to the fact of the passage tombs that you were relating to with <sighs> Newgrange and the death. I'm and glad because I wanted to go there next. <laughs> is exactly yeah. what the she is. Okay. So archaeologist says it's a passage tomb. So look at the symbolism of Elkmar in Tukmark Etain. Major encourages Angus. Now, I have to tell you, just to, to, to save any confusion, in some versions of the story, Dagda is the owner of the brew and Angus d- dispossesses him. In some versions, Elkmar is, the, is the, the, the owner. Now, Dagda is Angus's father and Elkmar isn't. That's the difference, okay? Elkmar is the one that Dagda sends away on the errand. So there's a confusion in the different versions of the tale. But the principal idea of the story is still the same. However, when Midger encourages Angus to go and challenge Elkmar, it's Samhain. Now, Samhain is the time when the, the doorway, the veil between this world and the next world is at its thinnest. So that should tell you something straight and, away. And it's Caliac territory as well, because we're coming into the, the winter. And yes, the, the, the when dying. she is coming into her full power, yep. as it were. Yeah. Uh, what is the vision? The vision, and it's fascinating. The vision is, Elkmar is standing on Brunabonia. He's standing on, on Schiedenbroga, on Newgrange. In Druidic garb. And what is he holding in his hand? He is holding in his hand a fork of white hazel. And that, to me, is an epically powerful image. And I'll tell you why. There's a lot of reasons why Elkmar is the vision of the Druid, the one who has come to the ownership of Newgrange through wisdom and poetry and the intuitive side of the human nature, okay? Not by science or by the measurement of data or, or material. Now, he's holding his fork of white hazel. That is an instrument of divination. So if you wanted to find a source of water, hazel grows beside water. Hazel rods can be used to divine water. So first of all, that gives you uh, a power as a person because, you know, uh, it is uh, suggested that some of the ancient sites are built over underground, uh, significant underground streams and sources of water. But I think that the problem with archaeology is that the archaeologist comes to Newgrange with a different type of rod the measuring rod you know the one with the white and red segments on it and you see it in all the pictures the archaeological pictures Mm -hmm. okay the archaeologists with the very best of respect to them have done a wonderful job in telling us something about the people and the community that built these things but Elkmar gives us an insight into the other side of things into the mythical side and the poetic side John Moriarty I think in Invoking Ireland wrote about coming through the nine waves as the Milesians did when they took Ireland from the Tuatha Dé And he said that failing to arrive poetically into Ireland, the Celt has failed in Ireland. And I think what he meant by that was that you cannot hope to live a full and proper existence according to your true nature if you've denied the poet in yourself and you've denied in in ancient ireland the poet held a uh, uh, equal almost status with the king in terms of ranks the poet was right up there almost with the king there's a reason for that because the poet had insight and knowledge and wisdom of a type that the scientific side of the brain and the one that wants to measure hard data cannot give you. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't deal with in- intuition in any way, shape or form. Mm-hmm. But for me, that's the most powerful, mm-hmm. probably the most powerful symbol from the wooing of Etain, from the Tuchmark Etain, is the vision of Elkmar standing on your range with the rod of hazel at Samhain. It's so, so powerful. And it links back into uh, what you were talking about, your inner wisdom and your inner knowledge in what was revealed to you in your dream in today's world, connecting with the myths of the Kaliak and the fear of embracing the shadow and how it related to you in today's world. 
Um, so maybe that's another clue in terms of Elkmar and the wisdom and just trusting that these things are given to us for our own personal empowerment. Well, if you think about Newgrange, uh, Sheed and Broga, as I like to call it, I like to empower it because I think its new name to some extent disempowers it or it, 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 it Disem disembodies and <laughs> dismembers it. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. yeah. But um, Newgrange, okay. Well, the idea is that you, you, uh, you, you cut yourself off from the outer life and the outer existence, the sense world, light and sound and smell and all the rest. And you, you enter this darkened world, this cave. You're going down into the belly of the earth, a bit like the Kalyak dream, you know, spiraling down into the darkness of the earth. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, it's a process of initiation, I suppose. Mm -hmm. You're entering the darkness of the womb mound. But what are you waiting for? You are waiting for this hugely dramatic transformation that happens on the night of the solstice. You're entering on the longest night of the year as an initiate into darkness, into the cold, empty darkness. And I can tell you, if you stay in a darkened, quiet space like that for a long period of time, you will begin to hallucinate. You will lose all sense of time and place and space and all the rest. Mm -hmm. Even when you go to Newgrange as part of a tour, they will turn off the lights to show you what it's like on the solstice. And then they light up with artificial light, yeah. showing you the light beam. But in those few moments of darkness, whether your eyes are open or not, you actually suddenly feel as if you're in a hugely expansive space. Mm. And I've written about that in Land of the Ever Living once, mm -hmm. where the, the Shandri, the wise old man, talks about his experience in Newgrange, where the stones appear to melt away mm -hmm. and he feels himself in this massive expansive space. You actually feel as if you've reached a moment of eternity where everything just has disappeared and you're just you could meld away into the universe and just become one with it in that moment. Mm -hmm. But then comes the brilliance, the moment where the sword of light shines in from the outside. The illumination. Yeah. So you have conquered your fear, back to the Campbell idea of the hero's journey. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. It's about crossing the threshold of fear. And to me, that's a much closer representation of what the word she means. And to me, as a she, in that sense, Newgrange has an awesome power mm. for the individual. Whereas the passage tomb that is Newgrange doesn't. Yes, it's fascinating and it's interesting. And yeah, humans with no tools or tools made of stone and bone and wood without mechanical diggers and all that did all this. Wow, yeah. they're fantastic. Yeah. But it doesn't give you that well, poetic, gonna... intuitive, spiritual, that whole immersion into a very different aspect of yourself. Yeah, and it's like, you know, when you go to Newgrange and they've done such a wonderful job at recreating the possibility of how people lived and yeah. what they used and the tools and the implements, as you say, it's all quite heady, you know, because it's, it's history and it's we're trying to assimilate the information with our head, whereas what you're saying is much more deeper than that and it's an experience it's something that we can actually feel in our bodies and maybe that's there's part there's a message in that as well. Well one of the things about I was talking earlier about people repeat stories and don't necessarily think or reflect yeah. too much upon their meanings sometimes the meaning percolates subconsciously mm -hmm. uh, which is something that has been written about in relation to the Kalyak among others that people keep telling the stories because they know that there's a, the essence of a uh, uh, an importance for them and there's the essence of an awakening for them or some process that is happening just by retelling the myths and so from time to time when I'm speaking with friends uh, who would be interested in mythology and you know similar like uh, Campbell and Jung and all those uh, people who have any similar interests we, we we mention the fact that in the mere retelling of the story you're actually activating something mm -hmm. and you're giving power to something which is one of the reasons I think that, for instance, the English changed all our place names to anglicised versions. Because in essence, we had a very strong tie to the land, as you know. Pre-famine, we had a very, very strong connection throughout our history to the land. But we saw it as a sacred thing. We had, in some essences, I believe, we had 
a similar relationship with the land as some of the Native American Indian tribes had. These tri tribal elders who liked to sit on the ground and to touch the earth and to feel that they were actually part of it. And the whole, the symbolism that's sometimes used in meditation of, you know, roots going down into the earth from your feet, I think that's very important because it gives you a connection with that. Part of the way you cut off that is to rename stuff and to take away the power of a place by saying, this is not Sheedinbroga anymore, it's not Sheonbru, mm -hmm. it's New Grange. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, that was the Cistercians, and that's just probably a loose example. But in only telling the stories and in only mentioning the place names, you can, I think, in some ways, activate things within people.